بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله this is the second session inshallah looking at the jewels and the pearls of the Quran from Imam Al-Ghazali's famous work Jawahir Al-Quran based on the translation of Dr. Thomas Cleary Rahimahullah. So, uh, inshallah, um, I wanted to, before that, just start with uh, a nice hadith to remind us of the blessing of this month. The Prophet Sallallahu was reported to have said, Imam al Bayhaqi relates this, Fi Shu'ab al-Iman, As-Siyamu al-Quran yashfa'ani lil-abdi yawm al-Qiyamah. The Quran, <coughs> fasting and the Quran both intercede for the servant on the Day of Judgment. يَقُولُ الصِّيَامُ So fasting will actually, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يُنْتِقُوا كُلَّ شَيْءٍ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامُ So everything that Allah determines will speak, will speak, including the hands, the tongue. When they asked the Prophet ﷺ how would he do that, he said the one who did it for all things will do it for the hand and the tongue. So fasting itself, some kind of personification will say, "Ay Rabbi, manatuhu al-ta'am wa shahawati bin nahar, fa shafi'ni fi." O my Lord, I pre prevented him from food and from his appetites during the day, so allow me to intercede for him. Wa yuqul al-Quran, manatu al-nawma bil layl, fa shafi'ni fi. Qala fa yushafi'an. And and the Quran itself will say, "I prevented him from sleeping during the night." And so allow me to intercede for him. And, it, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow them to intercede. So فَيُشَفَّعَانِ They're given intercession. Another uh, interesting hadith which is in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. أُنزِلَتْ صُحُفِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ فِي أَوَّلِ لَيْلَةً مِنْ رَمَضَانِ That the suhuf of Ibrahim and this in our tradition, the suhuf, it was given to Ibrahim. These are the, the actual... Um, revelation that was given to Ibrahim السلام, was in the Sahaf, which are like, we would call them today folios. Uh, Ibrahim السلام, was given them on the first night of Ramadan. And then the Torah was revealed on the sixth, uh, after the six days had passed of Ramadan, so that would be now. وَأُنزِلَ الْفُرْقَانُ لِأَرْبَعٍ وَعِشْرِينَ خَلَتْ مِنْ رَمَضَانِ And then the, the, um, the Qur'an was revealed uh, after 24 days had passed from Ramadan. So 25 or 27 or 29. So the, this is an indication of the power of this month, that all of the previous uh, revelations had been revealed uh, in this month. And the Qur'an was given to the Prophet ﷺ in this month. It came down in, in its entirety and then over 23 years it was revealed piecemeal to the Prophet the, This hadith, which is related by more than one, but it's important in, ter, uh, in terms of Imam al-Ghazali's methodology. مَا نَزَرَ مَنَ الْقُرَانِ آيَةٌ إِلَّا لَهَا ظَهْرٌ وَبَطْنٌ وَلِكُلِّ حَرْفٍ حَدٌ وَلِكُلِّ حَدٍ مَطْلَعٌ مُطْلَعٌ There's another riwayah that says that every uh, ayah that comes down has a haddun wa dhaharun wa batanun wa matta. So there's two different uh, recensions of this. But <clears throat> they differ on the meaning of this, but one of the meanings that Sidi Ahmad Zarruq points out in his book Lawah al Fasiya, he says that it has an outward meaning, an inward meaning, and then it has the had is for the fuqaha and the matla is for the arifin. So the Quran has outward meanings. The, is, the exoteric meanings, then it has inward meanings, and then it, it has hudud, and then it has a position that Allah subhanahu gives with what Imam al-Ghazali calls the ilm al-mukashifa, this unveiling that occurs for, the, for these people. So Imam al-Ghazali has his own taxonomy of the Quranic verses and sciences in Jawahar al-Quran, and that's why the books we're studying, because he's really giving you his methodology. And even though there, you'll find some of the ulama disagreed with him, overall it's been accepted by the ummah. This was considered uh, a, a, a very important book historically. So he talks about the six types of Quranic verses. The first one 
is it deals with the knowledge of Allah's attributes and his work. So th these are what he calls the jewels. The second is the knowledge of the straight path, Sirat al Mustaqim. In other words, how do we get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to knowledge of God and to his pleasure? And these he calls pearls. Now, one of the reasons that he does this is that jewels and pearls, you don't find them on the street. Uh, jewels, you have to mine for them uh, in the mountains. Pearls, you have to dive into the ocean to get. So he's, he's really letting us know that these are things that we have to struggle for. They're, they, they're, they're not simply, I mean, one of the, uh, in the gospel, it says, don't cast pearls to swine. In other words, don't give something precious to something unworthy of it. And this is why an, it's important to remember that Imam al-Ghazali sees everything in the world as a having a, a, a hidden meanings. So he would see jewels and pearls, the physical ones that people hold precious and will actually kill to obtain. That, that these have spiritual significances. So he's using them in that spiritual sense, the jewels and the pearls. And then people's condition on meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's different ahwal, fariqun fil jannah wa fariqun fil sa'ir. Allah says one group's in paradise, another group's in hell. And we don't know our condition with Allah. We hope that we're from the Najun, the people of Najat, the people of salvation, but only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows those conditions. Um, and then the conditions of believers and unbelievers. In, if you look, you can see the people here, their conditions. What Allah says that the, the believers have, who are they? They're people that they're, they're present in their prayer. They give out from what they've uh, been given. They have qualities. So he's saying that the Quran will give us these indications uh, here. And then also arguments of the kafirun and uh, the rudud. So arguments against people that deny the Quran, that attack the Quran. There's arguments in the Quran. One of the things that uh, the Quran does almost immediately is it gives a taxonomy of the three types of human beings. So there's believers, there's disbelievers, and then there's hypocrites. So already it's telling you, you're gonna be in one of those three categories. It's not a fourth category. And then the sixth are the stages of the path to God and how to prepare for it. So these are all really related and the knowledge of the straight path, you're gonna find them uh, in these others. And one of the things that he says is that there are verses in the, uh, in the Quran that will contain more than one. He will always look in order to determine which category it goes into, he will look what is the most important element. So if it's a jewel, despite the fact that it has other aspects in the verse, he'll always put it with the jewels. If it's a pearl, despite the fact that it has other uh, types in it, he'll put it with the pearls. So this is his methodology. And then he has the science, the, the 10 sciences. So one is he calls the pith, which is the lub, what's at the essence of it. So knowledge of God in the last day, knowledge of the straight path, fiqh and kalam, and these, this is the order. So he considers uh, the knowledge of Allah in the last day is, all, is going to go under, obviously kalam will be knowledge of Allah in the last day and, and of the Prophet. But kalam is the, the science that emerges out of it, just like fiqh is the science that emerges out of the knowledge of the straight path. So these are sciences that develop later. So the Quran has the usul of these things in them, but the furu' were brought out by the scholars over time. And this takes about 300 years before they're really solidified. And then you see a, a continual development, but overall within the first 300 years, you see uh, the solidification. And then also there's wow, and there's qasas, there's preaching, and there's story uh, telling. So these are the, at the essence of the Quran, and then he has what he calls the shell, which protects it. So one is the exoteric uh, exegesis, which means tafsir of just what it means outwardly. And then also the Arabic language, because you need Arabic to understand the Quran. Uh, we sent it down as a Arabic Quran. So it is in Arabic. And although we use translations, translations were really debated for, for a long time. In fact, when uh, Marmaduke Pikthal, Muhammad Marmaduke Pikthal, went to Al-Azhar, to get permission 
to translate the Quran. A lot of the scholars didn't want to give it because they did not, they, they actually were opposed to translations. Traditionally, the earliest translations come out of Persia where you got interlinear notes. So they helped uh, Persians to understand the Quran. But generally, the, 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 the ulama were of the opinion that the Quran cannot be translated, that it's an untranslatable work. And this is why uh, Al-Azhar actually, as a prerequisite for giving any seal of approval, that it's an interpretation or the meanings of the Quran, that it's not the Quran. And in fact, I thought it was interesting that uh, Dr. Bruce Lawrence, who wrote this very interesting biography of the history of the Quran in English, he actually says that he prefers to leave Quran, K-O-R-A-N, in English to mean the translation, and Al-Quran, which is now the new transliteration for it, to mean the, the Arabic Quran. So it's, it's very interesting, but when we say the Qur'an says and then we quote English, that's actually not really the Qur'an. Um, and inshallah there's something that the Arabs call majaz uh, al-hadf, uh, where you leave something at wasal al-qariya, ask the village, but it really means ahl al-qariya. It's like shahru Ramadan. Some of the ulama said you shouldn't say shahru Ramadan. You shouldn't say Ramadan without saying shahru Ramadan because Ramadan uh, was considered by some to be one of the names of Allah. So you don't say ja Ramadan. Um, s these are, inshallah, la yu'akhidhukumullahu bi laghwi fi aymanikum. Allah doesn't, inshallah, take people to account for... Um, these type of things, I think, there, there's, there's a generosity with our Lord, inshallah. But we do make mistakes, and um, especially when we're fasting. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping my brain is going to keep working. But um, the Arabic language is extremely important. Uh, and then Arabic grammar, because Arabic language is knowing, like the, the, the Sahaba knew the Arabic language, they didn't know Arabic grammar. If you asked one of the Sahaba, what's the difference between uh, bihi wa ism maf'ul, he wouldn't know what it was. If you asked him what Zaydun uh, Qa'im and what's Zayd and what's Qa'im, he wouldn't know Mubtada and Khabar. He wouldn't know a Jumla Ismiya from a Jumla Fi'liya. But he would understand them. So it's, you can know Arabic, the Arabic language, without knowing Arabic grammar. Grammar uh, is, a, it can go on for a long time to actually really get deep into grammar. If you end up with Mullah Jami, for instance, which is the great Central Asian scholar, um, you're, you're in the philosophy of grammar. Uh, most of the ulama uh, now will do the Alfi of Ibn Malik, which traditionally was an intermediate grammar, but now it's considered an advanced grammar. Um, in Mauritania, the, the ulama tend to do the ihmirar of Mukhtar al buna after the alfiya, and that's 3,000 additional lines of, of, of uh, the alfiya is 1,000 lines of grammar. That's another 3,000 for all the things that the alfiya doesn't deal with. So grammar is really important, and it's highly neglected. And one of the things that Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya says in his book, on um, Amali al-Dalalat, which are actually Amali. In other words, he, the book was just his lectures from, from his memory, and then they were transcribed. That's what, those are called Amali in our tradition. So there's a lot of Amali books where the ulama were just giving lectures and people would transcribe them. So uh, it, he says in Amali al-Dalalat that the and that it could be Dilalat is the way they say it in North Africa. It's one of those, it's called a Muthalath because it, it has all three, Dalala, Dulala, and Dilala in Arabic. But he says that there's a infikak, there was a separation of Arabic grammar from Sharia studies. So the, a lot of the students in the Sharia colleges, they learn grammar, but they don't learn it to the degree that's necessary to really navigate usul al-fiqh because a lot of usul al-fiqh deals with grammar and with uh, logha, with diction and things like that. And then you have to know the Quranic recensions. So the, these are also outwardly. So the recensions, there's 10 qiraat that are considered mutawatira. Um, 
seven are in the Shatabiyya from the great Andalusian scholar Imam Shatabi, not the Sahib al Muwafaqat, but the Qari, so, or the Muqri rather. So Imam Shatabi put all ten of the uh, seven of the Qiraat, and then Imam al Jazari uh, did a versification of, of, of the seven. So if you learn the Shatabiyya and the Durra, which is traditionally what's studied to learn the ten Qiraat, um, then you basically know all the different recensions. And then obviously there's riwayat of those recensions, but these are not significant differences, but they, they do differ in their pronunciations of things. Um, not in the actual letters, the attributes, but in, in, in the mudud, uh, in things like hamza, in things like the taqlil or the imala, so uh, saying things like uh, or like for instance in in Warsh, you have Tahi. It's the only time you'll have a little diamond under the Ha to let you know that it's, uh, it's, it's a Kasra. It goes to Kasra as opposed to between Kasra and uh, Fatha. So these, these are the recensions. And then you get into the Huruf, Usul al Huruf, and Furu' al Huruf. Um, and people spend their whole life studying this. It's, it's pretty amazing that we have this. I mean, it is a miracle, the recensions themselves. And then you have points of articulation. This is really tajweed. So learning tajweed, the sifat al-huruf, the what mustahaq al-huruf, haqqahu wa mustahaqahu. So, so it's what it's due and then what occurs to it, like idgham. So you have idgham bi ghunna, idgham bi ghayri ghunna. Learning those things. These are the 10 sciences that he puts forward. Now, if you look, um, he begins the Jawahir with the opening, Al-Fatiha. And the opening is, Al-Fatiha is a, is, it's a ism fa'il. So it's really the, the one that is opening for you. Um, so Surah Al-Fatiha opens the Quran. And there's a khilaf of whether or not Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is an ayah. In some qira'at it is, in some it's not. For, uh, so uh, in the qira'at that I learned, it's not from, from the Fatiha. It's considered a, um, a mark between the su suwar. So that was Imam Madik's position, radiallahu anhu. So, and the hadith in al-Bukhari indicates that قَسَمْتُ الْفَاتِحَةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي فَإِذَا قَالَ عَبْدِي الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ So in Al-Bukhari, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith Al-Qudsi begins Al-Fatiha with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So that wasn't one of the Imam Madik's proofs. But in any case, there is a khidaf about it. Imam Shafi'i who considers it an ayah and considers the, the prayer invalid if the Bismillah is not recited. Um, so there's a khidaf about that. Um, whether or not it's from the Fatiha. In any case, if we begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we always begin the Qur'an, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِدْ بِاللَّهِ If you read the Qur'an, seek refuge in Allah. So Allah tells us to seek refuge in Allah, من الشيطان الرجيم, from the accursed shaitan. So, عَوَذَا uh, is, is, uh, is to... To, ma'ad is a place of refuge. So we're seeking refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from shaitan because shaitan wreaks havoc on our species. Now, when, when we say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim shaitan is, that word, there's a, there's a difference of opinion. Does it come from shaitana or does it come from shata? Uh, so, so is the root sha Sheen ta noon, or is it sheen ya uh, ta? Th there's a difference. Is is it uh, from uh, fa'al or is it from fa'lan? The difference, if it if it's shaitan with a shatana, then it has to do with the one who's mubad. He's he's far from Allah, or he distances others from Allah. He causes others to become distant from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala spiritually. If it's uh, from shata yashitu, then it becomes, the meaning is halaka. So it's either the one who's halik or the one who yuhlik. He, and, and both are true. 
The word rajim, which is interesting also because rajim is one of those really interesting words in Arabic that can either mean fa'il or maf'ul. It can be an active or a passive. A passive. Um, now, when it's fa'il here, which is rajim, it could be marjum, the one who's stoned, or it could be rajim, the one yarjumu. So in other words, he's the one that does it to you. He makes you accursed by following him. So when you become a minion, so it could have both meanings according to Imam al-Akbari. Um, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. So Allah begins, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. This is basically saying that all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And He's Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So that, that, that lamb there is lilistihqaq. Praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, which is why whenever we praise anybody in the dunya, we say, MashaAllah. Because we're, we're acknowledging that it's a creation of God. And we're acknowledging that whatever good came from that person is actually really a good that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought into the world. So it all praise goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and whoever we praise, in, ultimately we are praising Allah. So it's an awareness that all praise is Allah's alone because this is His creation. So whatever's good in this creation is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, uh, he, he, uh, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim is, if, if you believe that the uh, Bismillah is an ayah, then it's repeated. Imam Al-Ghazali was Shafi'i, so he clearly saw this as being repeated. But one of the things Imam Al-Ghazali says is there's no replication uh, f f without meaning. In other words, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and then the Bismillah is the ism that, and then the Rahman or Rahim are attributes. Rahman is fa'lan and Rahim is fa'il. These are hyperbolic forms in Arabic. Rahman, fa'lan, is, is more hyperbolic. In other words, it's a stronger um, uh, sense than Rahim. They're both hyperbolic forms. What, what hyperbole is a rhetorical device in which you use to really emphasize something. So if you say alama, that's hyperbole. He's not just a scholar, he's a great scholar. So Rahman is, he's not just merciful, he is really merciful, he is compassionate. And, 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 and so that's, these are both hyperbolic forms which indicate the immense rahmah of Allah. And the reason he, he says that this is repeated after Rabbil Alameen is because it is from his mercy that he brought everything into existence. So his rububiya is an attribute of his mercy. The fact that he brought everything into existence is, is from his rahmah. And the, the greatest rahmah that, that he sent to us, for us, is the Prophet وسلم, because it's guidance. Uh, so his guidance is the greatest rahmah he gives us. After his creation, he created us, but then he provides us with guidance. Now, Maliki Yomi Deen, uh, Dr. Cleary translated as ruler of Judgment Day. That's uh, one way, and that would actually be probably Milik, which is the Warsh re uh, recension. And I, there's a few others. So you have Milik and Malak and Milik and Malik. Malik is the possessor, and Milik is the sovereign or the ruler. What's interesting is these two forms both indicate something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So not every Malik is a Malik. And, and, and not every Malik is a Malik. So the reason for that, if, if, if you have a king, a king doesn't necessarily own everything in his dominion. If he's a tyrant, he can take whatever he wants. But if, if he's a benevolent king, then he owns what he owns, but then he's a caretaker. He's somebody who is responsible for his subjects, but he's not gonna steal their wealth. Whereas the Malik, he owns. 
And so Malik and Malik indicate that Allah not only is the sovereign of that day, but it's all his dominion. There's nothing that does not belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means he cannot oppress his creation. There's nothing that he can do that will, will, be, will be warranted uh, giving God the name of oppressor. It's impossible for God to oppress because you cannot oppress your own possessions. If, 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 if you own something that, and, and, and you say you burn something, like take, you take a coat, and you burn it and somebody sees you burn it, they say, well, why are you burning that? And you say, well, it's, it's, got to, it's infected um, and I, I have to burn it. So you're explaining to him, but he really has no business asking you if it's your coat. You can do what you want with your own property. So that's the point of Medic and Malik, that he is both. Yom ad the, the day of judgment or the day of requital, in, in, in his uh, larger translation, he, he translates it as the day of requital. This is the day when debts fall due. So Dean and Dane are related. It's the day when there's a reckoning, an accounting. It is you that we worship, and to you we appeal for help. So when you have iyaka na'budu, when you put the, the what would normally be in, in the maf'ulun bihi position, because it's na'buduka. But when you say na'buduka in Arabic, it doesn't create, uh, the, it doesn't eliminate other things. So you could say that somebody ya'bud allaha wa ya'bud shams He worships Allah and he worships the, the sun. But you can't say iyaka na'budu was shams. Iyaka means that only you alone we worship. So when you say iyaka na'budu, it means you alone. It is you that we worship and no one else. Wa iyaka nasta'in. And to you we appeal for help. Fa'idha sta'ant fasta'in billah. Like the Prophet gave his advice to his, uh, his, his uh, cousin, Ibn Abbas, He's, when he was very young. He told him, if you're going to seek help, seek help from Allah. Which doesn't mean that you don't seek asbab, but you understand that it's only Allah. Even the asbab are from Allah. So you have to understand everything is from Allah. So it's you alone we help. So even when, when we're seeking help from creation, we know that it's you that has facilitated for us help from others. He's the one who gave you victory Allah gave you victory and he gave you the believers to help you, but that's from Allah. So the help that the Prophet got from his companions was from Allah. So only uh, seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. sirat al mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. Istiqama is uprightness. So this path is the path of uprightness. And then sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim ghayr al maghdubi alayhim waradhalin. The way of those you have graced, uh, show us a straight path. The way of those you have graced, an amta alim, you've blessed them, you've graced them. Not of those whom is your, uh, on whom is your wrath. So the ghadab of Allah is on them. Al maghdub alayhim, the ghadab is on them. Nor of those who wander astray. So these are the two ways of going astray. One is with knowledge, so you know what you should be doing and you don't do it. And that's why. The, the Muslims are in such a, prairie, a per, precarious situation because so many Muslims, I don't know any Muslim that, that in the Muslim world where I, where, when I live there that doesn't know the hadith al-rashi wa murtashi nar that the, the one who bribes and the one who takes a bribe is, they're both in hell. I don't know anybody that doesn't know that. It's a very well-known hadith. It's, you could almost say it's ma'lum in al-din daruratan. It's not, but you could almost say that it is because so many people know that hadith and yet, there's so much of bribery. So that's when you incur the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is when you know what you should do and you don't do it. Whereas the dalin, those who are astray, those are people that don't know and, and, and they're just wandering. In the, in the verse in the Quran uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Prophet was dalan fahada. Like, didn't he find you dalan? It doesn't mean that he was astray. It means that he was seeking. That's why he was going into the ghar of Hira and doing these things. 
So don't make us from people that don't have guidance, that, that might be looking for guidance or are just astray. So these are people like, for instance, um, traditionally, a lot of the scholars put the religious categories in there. I don't think it's a good thing to, some, unfortunately, some of the translations actually put between parentheses, um, you know, other religious uh, traditions and things. It's not really, um, I don't think it's a good thing to do in a translation because that goes under commentary and uh, it, it just makes it look like, it takes away the umum level It takes away the umum level which is the general statement. Those are the two ways people go astray. If you want to see it archetypally, that it, it's in all religions and it's certainly in the Islamic religion. There are people that know the truth and they don't practice it. Those are maghdub alayhim. Uh, if, 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 uh, if they continue on their way and don't make tawbah. And then the dalin are people, they're ignorant. There's ignorant Muslims that just don't know and so they uh, don't practice what they should learn. في معاني والعلوم التي تضمنها القرآن These are the sciences, the meanings and the sciences of the Quran. So this is from Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi's and I think it's very useful because it adds to Imam al-Ghazali's. The first one, he says, these are the ma'ani, the seven meanings of the Qur'an that, um, that Allah subhanahu revealed uh, these meanings to us. The first one is ilm al rububiyyah which is knowledge of our Lord, Rabb al-Alamin, who is our Lord. So this goes to Imam's jewels. And then nubuwa, which is the communication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us through these people that have this special quality. This, this extraordinary angelic quality of purity and Allah has prepared them for a revelation. The third is the ma'ad, eschatology. What happens after we die? What's the eschaton? What's coming later? And then the fourth is the ahkam of basically how to live in the world. So this is transactional. It's ahkam between, in the vertical alignment with your Lord. That relates to all the devotional rules that we have. And then in the horizontal alignment with, with creation, transactional things of learning how uh, to, uh, to basically buy and sell in, in marriages, how to behave, all these things. And then the wa'ad, which is the promise. And then the wa'id, which is the threat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet as Bashir and Nadir. So he's both giving us a promise, if you obey Allah, then here's the promise. And then there's a wa'id, a threat. And then finally al-qasas, which really inform us of all these things. So the, 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 one of the most beautiful uh, stories that we have in all of the Quran are, uh, are Ahsan al-Qasas, they're the most beautiful stories. But Yusuf salam, you will find all of these in the chapter of Yusuf. So you're going to find Ilm al-Rububiyya, Nabuwa, Ma'ad, Ahkam, Wa'ad, Wa'id, al-Qasas. You'll find all of them. So the Qasas embody, uh, the, 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 they're, they're, they're really embodiments of all these meanings. And then he, he gives certain knowledges that you should not go into the Quran. And Imam al-Ghazali in the Jawahir, uh, he talks about the, um, uh, rather in Mishkat al-Anwar, he talks about the, this hadith about uh, whoever um, attempts to interpret the Qur'an with his opinion, bil-ra'i, with his opinion. And ra'i comes from ru'ya, from how you see things. It's your perspective. That's what an opinion is. It's, it's your perspective about things. So ra'a, uh, you know, he saw something, um, and and it's, it's, it's how you're looking at something. He says that that is misunderstood, that it doesn't mean that scholars can't interpret the Quran. And Imam uh, Fakhruddin al-Razi, uh, who has a, a, a tafsir that has a lot of ra'i in it, Imam, uh, Fakhruddin says that it is not, just because it was not said by the Prophet or the Salaf, that we can't find meanings in the Quran. That, that that's a, a methodology that's permitted to seek out new meanings in the Qur'an, but it has its requisite knowledges. And so Imam al-Ghazali says what that hadith means, that you know, whoever Quran whoever interprets the Qur'an with his opinion, let him take his seat in hell. He said it means like just out of desire 
to, to conform with his own desires. So he has his own nafs desires and, and he interprets the Quran to suit his opinion. Like uh, recently you've had commentaries that try to interpret the story of Lut to say that it wasn't about homosexuality. Well, what's, what's the agenda behind that? Like who, who's, who's actually making those interpretations? Because nobody in the history of Islam ever made those interpretations. And so it wasn't just homosexuality, but that was a central part of why they were condemned um, for acting on their homosexuality. So um, that would be, according to Imam al-Ghazali, interpreting it with opinion. And the same is true. And then he said, or not having uh, recourse to the exegetes, which means the science of tafsir. So you have, you have to know tafsir, you have to know the qira'at. I mean, one of the things about, the, uh, there was a, a South Asian man who claimed to be the, the, the seal of the prophets, like the last one. Because, because uh, you know, you have khatam and nabiyin. But in, in Nafi' it's khatim. So there's khatam, which is seal. So he said the Prophet was the seal. But in Nafi' it's khatim, which means the last, the final. So right there, because he didn't know the qira'at, he made a huge mistake about the nature of the Prophet's mission. The Prophet is la nabiyya ba'di. There's no Prophet after him. Ahkam um, al-Qur'an, this is a really important area. Imam al-Jassas, the great Hanafi scholar, wrote uh, a book on this. Uh, the uh, Imam al-Qurtubi, the great Maliki scholar, uh, Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, has a book called Ahkam al-Qur'an in four volumes, uh, Asayis. There's many uh, uh, books that deal with just the ahkam al-Qur'an. These are ayat al-ahkam, about 500 ayahs in the Qur'an that deal with specifically with legal matters. And so uh, knowing that. And then nasq, knowing uh, abrogation. And there's a big khilaf about this. Some of them have over 100 verses. There's only a handful of verses uh, that are agreed upon about nasq. And generally with the abrogation, the Ibn Taymiyyah's principle is sound, that if the conditions of abrogation come uh, again, then the, they would be muhkama. So many of the, hadith, the verses that relate to qital, they don't apply in places where you don't have state authority or anything like that. Uh, in those places, you actually apply all of those hadith, all of the ayahs that deal with patience, and um, uh, suffering the tribulations of the place you're in if you can't make hijrah. Mm. And then the hadith, you have to know hadith because the hadith, some of the hadith, you fasir al-Qur'an and the Prophet ﷺ is the greatest commentator of the Qur'an in his sayings and his actions. He was the Qur'an. Uh, the saying that he was the Qur'an, kan al-Qur'an yimshi, is, is isti'ara. It's, it's not a literal uh, meaning, but but uh, Aisha said in a sound hadith, "Kana khuluquhu al-Quran." He 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 embodied the khuluq of the Quran, like all of his character was from the Quran. And then six, knowing the stories of the Quran. So there are many stories in the Quran, knowing them: Musa and Fir'aun, the story of Suleiman, the story of Dawood with the man who comes asking him. Uh, he has his question. Um, and then tasawwuf. Tasawwuf is a valid science of Islam. If you get into turuq and into uh, some of the ways that tasawwuf has manifested, then that's a completely different thing. But the idea that tasawwuf is not from Islam is a completely modern view of some people. It has nothing to do with traditional Islam. Everybody accepted the idea of tasawwuf. Uh, and, and all of the great scholars of Islam uh, speak well of this science, including Ibn Taymiyyah uh, and uh, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, many, many of uh, the scholars. So, but there are deviant Sufis, like there's deviant grammarians, there's deviant fuqaha, there's deviant, there's deviant every group has deviants. And 
So, and there's a lot of charlatans in Tasawwuf traditionally. In fact, you know, I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. When I, when I was studying Arabic years ago, I, I read the maqamats. You know, you have this uh, uh, genre. And, and the characters in the maqamat, they were like uh, religious charlatans, which was a little shocking for me at the time. You know, I was 22, 23 years old. And I read these stories. And they would, they'd do things like they'd go to the mosque and claim they saw the prophet and tell all the people that the prophet told him to, that they should all give charity to him. And then he'd just steal the money and go off. But I realized later as I got older and just the fraudulent nature of so many people on this planet, and I'm dealing with some fraud right now. So you really, my, my, when I wrote The Purification of the Heart, my father read it and he was like, one page on fraud? I don't think so. That was, that was his comment. So and he, you know, so he 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 was defrauded uh, of by some really nefarious people. So fraud is part of life, and the worst types of frauds are religious frauds. I mean, I'll take a a, a, a gumba from Queens or New Jersey over a over a religious fraud. You know, these people that trick people with um, religiosity. So. You, you'll get that, you'll find that, you know. Um, and then usul al-din, which is basically knowing um, the, the aqidah of the Muslims. So you have usul al-fiqh and usul al-din, which some people call it fiqh al-akbar, Abu Hanifa's term. Um, usul al-fiqh is knowing how to derive the rulings out of fiqh. And then logha, which is really important in our deen to know the language of the Quran. The Quran uses, um, there's gharib al-Quran, there's words in the Quran that you think you know what they mean because you know Arabic, but then when you look in the tafsir you find out that they don't mean what you think they mean. And there's a lot of that in the Quran. Um, and then nahu, absolutely necessary. You have to learn grammar. And then finally, rhetoric. Al-Bayan, that's the, uh, the 12th. So th those are his. Now, when we get to um, just beginning with, uh, uh, back to the Jawahir. So I just wanted that as a prelude to this. When we get to the Jawahir of the Quran, Imam al-Ghazali identifies these, what he calls the jewels, and then what he calls the pearls. So the jewels are those that relate directly to Allah and to his attributes and his acts. The pearls are those that relate to the Sirat al-Mustaqim. So this first verse would be really a pearl because it's indicating here's the guidance. Like this is the book that's going to take you to God. So ذَلِكَ kitab, and that's for ta'zim, ذَلِكَ kitab. Allah is يُعَظِّمُ كِتَابُهُ so, so he's using, it's a ism it's a it's a type of what we call a demonstrative pronoun, but it's a demonstrative pronoun, not for something close, but for something far, generally, but it's for ta'zim. So it's this book, this magnificent, this momentous, this great book. لا ريب. And some stop there. لا ريب فيه. There's no doubt in it. لا ريب فيه. That لا is نفي للجنس. So لا ريب فيه. It's very interesting to start a book by letting you know from the very start of it that there's absolutely no doubt in the book. In other words, rest assured, this book is free of doubt. هدى للمتقين. Here the هدى is put into the what we would call indefinite. So it's a nek it's tenkir li ta'zim. So it's nekira for ta'zim uh, in, in grammar, in, uh, sorry, in rhetoric. So, so the, the nekira here indicates, again, that this is divine guidance. This is not ordinary guidance. This isn't guiding you on the road to the marketplace. This is something mu'avvam. It's real guidance. Huda lil muttaqeen. The muttaqeen... Dr. Cleary, and, and he, I think he's the only person probably, I don't know if ever, but certainly I don't know anybody else. But there, I think maybe Uzutsu, there might be some others. But he could read the Hindu scriptures, the Buddhist scriptures, 
the, the Christian scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, and the Muslim scriptures. So those are the five major world religions in their, in their original tongues. And, and really well. I mean, he, he knew Sanskrit, he knew Pali, he, he translated the Dhammapada from Pali, and he actually identifies something in there of a prediction of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he knew Greek, he knew Hebrew, and he knew uh, Arabic. And so when, when you see his word choice, you really have to think about it. And one of the things that he says in his, um, the reason why he chose this word, in fact, his, one of the most interesting things about this translation are, are the notes that he put in the back because it really shows you the, the kind of extraordinary insights that he had. Um, but he says, conscientious, muttaqin. This is from the root waqiya, which has primitive meanings of guarding, preserving, safeguarding, protecting. Muttaqin comes from the fifth or the eighth measure of the root and means to be aware, to be wary, be on guard, protect oneself, and fear the wrath of God. I have used the word conscientious to render this on many occasions because its original meaning, in other words, the original meaning of conscientious in the English language, uh, combines these ideas fairly well. And because the word conscientious has weakened to such a degree in contemporary usage that the connection between duty to God and duty to humanity is no longer clear and needs to be revitalized by using the word in such a way as to retrieve its original meaning and force. So he's very specifically choosing this because he feels that it combines both your duty to God because conscientious traditionally meant somebody who was scrupulous in his moral activities. And that's one of the meanings. And one of the problems with language, and this is where a lot of uh, people uh, don't understand, is that language has multiple usages. So, so you can have very specific words, like in Arabic, you can have a really specific word that's used for, like, ka'as. Ka'as in Arabic has to have liquid in it. If it doesn't have liquid, it's not a cuss. So this is a book without doubt has guidance in it for the conscientious. That's how he's chosen to translate it. And now they're described. Alladini yuminun bil ghayb or yu'minun. Warsh is yuminun. Alladini yuminun bil ghayb wa yuqimun as-salata wa mimma razaqnahum yunfiqun. Those who believe in the unseen. Now, what is the ghayb? Well, the ghayb is anything you can't see. But the question becomes, are things that we can now see in electron microscopy from the unseen? Uh, the, these are problems now. But um, generally, the unseen would be the spiritual world, not the material world. So anything that's in the material world, and this is very important in Imam al-Ghazali's, <clears throat> in his entire world view, because he really sees the binary of alam al ghaybi wa shahada, the unseen world and the seen world. And this is constant through his, his works. So he really sees the mulk and the malakut. Occasionally, not that often, he'll bring in a third <coughs> term, <coughs> which is the Jabarut. <clears throat> but generally, he has this binary of the seen and the unseen. <clears throat> so there are people that believe in the unseen, in Allah, in the angels, in the afterlife, all these things that we can't see. وَيُقِيمُونَ الصلاة. It's very interesting. It doesn't say يُصَلُّون. Right? Like it could have said يُصَلُّون. But it says يُقِيمُونَ الصلاة. Right? So, the salah is, it's an established practice. Aqama salah. So you can say, yusalli, ana salaita dhuhr. But iqama is to be muqeem in it. It's something that's constant. So they, they're constant in their prayers. So <clears throat> this is really, really important. And also establishing the prayer, the, congression, the uh, congregational prayer is very important. Wa mimma razaqnahum yunfiqoon. And from what we have provided them, they give out. Now, this is, in other words, it doesn't say from what they were provided. We gave them. 
we provided for them. So this is risk. And your risk has obligations because you're mustakhlaf. You have been given a trust that was held by, by people before you. If you inherited wealth, it was your parents' trust or your uncle or whoever you inherited it from. But if you uh, have earned the money here, it's a sacred trust nonetheless that Allah has given you because he's the one that gave you your physical strength. He's the one that gave you your intelligence. He's the one that provided all the things that enabled you to work in order to get that. So whatever you have earned is actually from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which goes back to Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah. All provision is due to Allah. So this, everything belongs to God. He possesses everything that is in the heavens and the earth. But he has, in essence, loaned it to us. And, and, and that loan is an amana. Now, while we have it, we ha it's our property. So we are the malik by sharia. But in haqiqa, in reality, we're only renters. And, and we're going to have to pay that rent by using it. What he has... The, the conditions of rent, the rental agreement that God has given us is that we follow his sharia. That's the payment, that you do what he commanded us to do. If you do that, you've paid the rent. And, and then on Yom Qiyamah, you have no debts. Now, most of us are going, likely going to have debts on the Day of Judgment. And that's when the renter says, I'm going to let you slide. That's what renters do if they have a good renter, but okay, he, he got laid off and he's having a hard time and he's trying to get a job. And then, so the, the landlord says, you know, don't worry about it. I, I, I can handle this. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need for anything. So like a, a kind person here who would give you a break, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is arham ar rahimin He's the most merciful of those who show mercy. So we should always give out from what Allah has provided us. Now what does Allah ask for? Right? Allah says in the Quran, they ask him, what do we give out? He says, qul al -afu. Say whatever they have extra. It's the afawi. It's what, it's what they can give out. Allah's not asking for everything. He's asking for something. He's given you everything. He's asking for something back. And not for himself. Right? He's asking you for something back for others in need. And, and that's, that's, that's basically it. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِرَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِرَ مِنْ قَبْرِكَ وَبِلَا خِرَتِهُمْ يُوْقِنُونَ And those who believe in what was sent down before you. So we believe in all the prophets that were sent down before us. صِدْكَ حُجَّتُنَا uh, Ibrahim ala qawmi. We, all the prophets that, that we gave, those 19 that are mentioned in that verse, those are all prophets that were given uh, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we follow uh, uh, the prophets by following the last prophet. He's our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But all of them are our prophets in that we believe in them and we accept their revelations. But, our, but the Prophet ﷺ came with the most updated version, and this is why we believe uh, in our Prophet ﷺ as being the only one that we need, we get the guidance from him directly. And there's a khilaf about the shara' min qabrina verses in the Qur'an that deal with previous dispensations, whether or not they apply to us or not. But generally, we have all the guidance that we need from our Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ, when he saw Omar looking in the Torah, he said, why are you looking at in that? Like you have the Quran. We don't need that's, that book. It's a good book. Fihi hudan. Right? Fihi nur. You know, the, in, it, it has guidance in it. Immense uh, wisdom in the Bible, both in Old and New Testament. Um, so, uh, but we have been given this. And what was sent down before you, and are certain of the hereafter, they have a yaqeen about the akhirah. So they don't doubt. Now people, I, and I, many people have asked me this, you know, that, like I have doubts. You have to distinguish between what Dr. Cleary often referred to as the host and the guest. So the, the host is who you are. That's your essential nature. The guest 
our uninvited thoughts. And so you can, you can have uninvited thoughts that come into your heart and don't take them seriously. But they'll come, shaitan yuwaswisu fi sudurin an nas, you know. Shaitan is waswas. I mean, that's one of his names. He's the obsessor. He's going to assail you with thoughts and make you think that it's you. So we have that differentiation. And in fact, some of the traditional Christian guilt was based on not having that differentiation, of not realizing that your thoughts are not necessarily yours. There's, there's khawatir shaitaniya, khawatir nafsaniya, you know. But what is your true nature? So if you're a believer, that's your host. And then the uninvited guest comes in. Uh, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq says, وَمَا يُوَسْيُسُ بِهِ الشَّيْطَانُ وَالْقَلْبُ يَأْبَاهُ هُوَ الْإِيمَانُ What comes into your heart from shaitan and your heart rejects it, that's iman. That is iman. فَلَا تُحَاجِجْ عَنْدَهُ اللَّعِينَ فَإِنَّهُ يَزِيدُهُ تَمْكِينَ So don't debate with him. Don't try to fight him. Just let the thought go. Let it pass. Uh, these are khawatir. They're just uh, what the Arabs call sahabu sayf. Clouds of the summer, you know, they just dissipate, they're gone. Or Sahabatul Saif. Ula'ika ala hudam min rabbihim. So these are the ones who are, they are the ones that follow the guidance from their Lord. They're on the guidance that God gave them. Here he translates, wa ula'ika hum al muflihun. Here he translates, they're the happy ones. Which obviously, if you're successful, you're happy. In in his larger commentary, uh, his larger interpretation, which is this. Unfortunately, this is no longer available, but um, it it is uh, available on on uh, on Kindle. But inshallah, uh, try to get that out again. Uh, in here, he calls them the successful ones. So this was later. He did this. Um, several years after this. He did this after the Gulf War. He was very troubled by what had happened <clears throat> and how Muslims were being demonized. So he wanted to do the essential Quran to just show people basically Jawahar al-Quran, what, what Imam al-Ghazali identified as the central, essential meanings of this book, which is why it's called the essential Quran. Inna al-ladina kafaru sawa'un alayhim as for the ungrateful who refuse, it is the same to them, whether you warn them or not, they do not believe. So kafir is a really difficult word in Arabic. Uh, even theologically, it's a problematic term. Kafara means to cover over. In fact, arguably cover, which has the same sounds in it, might have some, it might just be a, one of those coincidences of language, but who knows? I actually have a book that attempts to prove that all language goes back to Arabic. Um, that a lot of it's stretching, but believe it or not, in 1828, uh, Mr. Webster, uh, Noah Webster, who wrote the first American dictionary, and, and Noah Webster was a very pious man. He actually has a really brilliant little book called Advice for the Young, which is all how to stay on the path. Um, but anyway, Noah Webster w felt America needed to have its own English and not be tied to the old country. Uh, he was, had that real uh, American kind of independence, right? We're not English. We have our own way of speaking our language. So he created this dic uh, dictionary, but what he wanted to prove in that dictionary, believe it or not, was that all of English went back to Hebrew as the source language of the world. What he found, though, was there were more cognates in Arabic than in Hebrew. So he ended up putting a whole bunch. Of, he knew Arabic from, uh, he studied Hebrew and Arabic, I think, I think at Harvard. But anyway, so if you look at the, you can get a facsimile of his 1828 edition, and it has got all these Arabic words in there, which is like he says, cave is kaf, cave, kaf, and then ard is earth. Ard, earth, and then cover, kafar. So he's got all these uh, babus, baby, 
Uh, he goes on and on. It's very interesting. But uh, what, what, what is fascinating is where did they get lithographic typesetting in 1828 in the United States in Arabic? That's what really surprised me. Like, where did they get the lithograph to do that? Amazing. So kafar, kufar, what, what, what's important to know, it means ingratitude. Like the Prophet ﷺ said that, that, that women in particular had to be very careful of what he called kufran al-ishra, to be ungrateful for the companionship of their husbands. Because husbands can be very difficult and can have, you know, they can get grumpy, they can do all these things. And, but, you know, they're important, right? They're, they're taking care of you. They're, they're hopefully paying all the bills and things like that. Uh, so the Prophet ISM said, you know, it was important not to fall into a kind of ingratitude and vice versa. The man, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu once a man came knocking on his door uh, to complain about his wife. This was in, this Medina was a small city. And so he went to come, and then he heard there was a fight inside the house. And his wife was kind of saying things to Omar. He said, oh my God, if that's Omar's wife, what am I complaining about? So he's gonna leave, Omar opened the door, said, where are you going? And he said, no, 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 I, I made a mistake. He said, no, no, you came for a reason. What'd you come for? And then he explained to him, and he said, Omar laughed. And said, my wife takes care of me. She does all these things, take care of the children. I should be patient if she gets upset. So it's a, it, it goes both ways. So that's kufran. It's an ingratitude. And then kafir is also somebody who knows the truth and rejects it. I mean, that's really the essential aspect. So the truth has become clear and they reject it. That's real kufr. And that's why and we're going to get to that. Don't put idols beside God knowingly. It's a jumla haliya. So in other words, you know what you're doing. Don't do that wittingly. Don't do it knowingly. So kufr, Allah always spoke before the hujjah was on the Arabs. He spoke Ya Yuhannas. So all the Meccan, they, even though they were not Muslims, he's calling them Nas. He doesn't call them kuf, Kufar. He calls them Nas because they're being invited to the calling. Once the Hujjah was established, once they saw the miracles of the Prophet, once the Quran, they understood the Quran, which was their language, and they knew they couldn't imitate it, then they had no excuse. So to apply that to the rest of humanity, most of the people that you see are Nas. And in fact, one wonders, should we really assume people are Muslim before we assume they're not Muslim? Why, why would you make the assumption that people, I mean, I was sitting with, and uh, Nazim Bakhsh was with me from Canada. We were sitting with John Taylor Gatto. And I looked at John Taylor Gatto and I said, you know, John, because he, he was a wonderful human being that really loved people and loved education and, and did amazing things in education. Unprecedented teacher of the year out of 54,000 teachers in New York four times, like nobody else had ever done even it twice. So I said to John, you know, John, you're a Muslim. And he looked down for about 30 seconds, and then he raised his head and he said, I accept that. Now, according to Abu Hanifa, that makes him a Muslim. In fact, according to Abu Hanifa, anybody that calls the Prophet, Prophet. So if somebody calls the Prophet Wasallam Muhammad the Prophet, that must mean that they think he's a prophet. So, I mean, obviously you can get into details and push people, that's fine if you want to do that, but having a good opinion just generally is a, a good thing to do. Um, but there are kuffar, I mean, there are kuffar, and there are evil people in the world, and we shouldn't be Pollyannish about that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that, you know, he says, it's, it's the same to them, whether you warn them or don't, don't warn them. Well, we know if you think about, you, they could have said that about Abu Sufyan, because Abu Sufyan fought the Prophet. All, for, look at how many years he fought the Prophet. So could, people could have just written him off and said, oh, it's sawa'un alayhi in adartu wa lam tundirhu. Right, he, he's not gonna believe. Well, he ended up becoming a Muslim. So just because somebody rejects it, initially doesn't mean this is that these are people that it's Allah has sealed their fate because they they have rejected the truth 
and they're not amenable to uh, remediation. So that's the kafir. So we should be very careful about that, just about people. There's a lot of good people that if, if we were more upright as an ummah, if we were delivering the message as an ummah, maybe they would respond. But when you look at the Muslim world, there's a lot of places where it just doesn't look too appealing. And a lot of people think that has to do with Islam. So in some ways we have become, uh, you know, I had a Saudi friend who said, Islam has the best case with the worst lawyers. <laughs> so, um, ah, Allah Allah has sealed their hearts. There's a khatam on their hearts. وَعَلَى سَمْعِهِمْ وَعَلَى أَبَصَارِهِمْ أَوْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ غِشَاوَةً And on their sight, there, there's a covering. There's a غِشَاوَةً They can't see. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ There's an amazing story that Leopold Weiss, who became Muhammad Asad, I don't know if people know, uh, but he, he became Muslim in 1926, and then he went to Arabia, and he ended up, um, he, he knew Arabic, he knew Hebrew, he was actually trained in the Torah. Um, he comes from a long line of rabbis, but his father, I think, was a successful businessman. Anyway, he was raised with the Torah. And then he, um, he in 26, he converted to Islam. And then he went to um, Saudi Arabia, and he actually became an advisor to uh, Abd al-Aziz, King Abd al-Aziz. Um, he, was, he was living in Mecca at the time, and then, uh, and then he ended up, after that, he, in 1932, he went to Pakistan, which was not Pakistan yet, because it comes Pakistan in 47, but in 42, uh, in, uh, 42 32, he goes to Pakistan, and he actually uh, lives there, learns, I think, Urdu, became a Pakistani citizen, and helped them... Uh, he, he translated a Bukhari, uh, and then it, he lost the translation, got burnt down, his house burnt down, lost the whole translation. It was tragic, because he really knew Arabic well. But anyway, he tells how he became Muslim, which is an amazing story in, uh, in his book, uh, Road to Mecca. He said that he and his wife Elsa, they were on a, a train in Vienna. He was from Austria, so they're on a train, and he's, he's looking at a man across from him, he was a businessman, a portly businessman. And he said he looked like a well-educated, well-fed, and wealthy man. But he said he looked at his face and he saw this pain and worry and torment on his face. He said his lips were pursed as if he was troubled by something. And then he looked around and he noticed everybody on the train looked like that. And if you've ever been on a subway in New York, you know exactly what he's talking about. After you know the five o'clock subway, after a day of that horrible grind. You know, surely in the afternoon man is at loss. So he, he, he's look, and then he looks to Elsa and, and, he, and he says to her what he's noticing. And then she looks and she says, you know, you're right. He actually says she looks like uh, somebody who a, a painter would look at faces that they're about to paint. You know, she really inspects them, and she says, they look like they're suffering the torments of hell. So he goes back to the apartment, and he had been reading the Quran, and it was open. And he goes actually to put it away, but his eyes fall on al-hakamu takathiru hatta zurtum al-maqabir, that vying for more has you bedazzled until you go to your graves. And then it says, surely you will come to know. Surely you will come to know the hell that you are in. And you will see it. Right? And he, 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 like, he said he started shaking physically. And then he called Elsa and he says, read that. Isn't that what we just saw? And she said, yes. And he said, I knew at that moment this book was true because he said he felt it was predicting a state 
that, that would come towards the latter days in this mechanized world of alienated people living these empty, meaningless lives because the peoples of the past had generally religion, they had s sacred, they had festivals and things. Now they're just, they're lost without, they have spiritual Alzheimer's, completely unaware of who they are, where they come from, who created them, where they're going, all of this, nine months in the womb, being fed through an umbilical cord, right? Kept at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, with oxygen coming in through the blood from your mother's breath, forming the brain, the spinal cord, all of these things, all of this for what? Billions and billions of cells coming together almost instantaneously with incredible order, an opposable thumb to create all these tools with, a tongue to articulate our needs. SubhanAllah. Malakum, what's wrong with you? That, uh, Allah says that several times in the Quran. What is wrong with you? Malakum la tanasurum. What's wrong that you don't help one another? Ma gharraka bi rabbika kareem alladhi kharaqaka fasawaka fa'adaraka fi ayyi suratin ma sha'a rakkabak. What has deluded you from your generous Lord? The one who fashioned you and formed you and then assembled you. Rakkabak, tarkiba, and they literally call DNA in modern Arabic. They, they use tarkiba as the word. Assembled you into this extraordinary creation. And so the people that can't see that, they have a rishawa. And that's why believers, Christian believers, Muslim believers, Jewish believers, believers of any stripe, just don't understand why some people can't see this so clearly. Well, there's your answer. I was with my son, Yahya, we were looking at this incredible sunset uh, up at the upper campus just this palette of incredible colors. And I just looked at him, I said, how can people not believe in God? And he looked at me, he said, dirty windows? <laughs> it's about as good as, good, good as an answer gets. So, painful torment, they're already in it. You know, demonic people living demonic lives, all these people defrauding old people. You know, all these people cheating and stealing and robbing, they're already in hell, you know. They're just going from, from one hell to another one. They're already there. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ And among humankind. One of the things that Dr. Cleary did, and I think it's worth, um, and I'll, I'll end with this. I think it's really worth looking at his explanation because uh, you know, he was a deeply co contemplative man and just had great insights. But he says here, another special problem in translating from the Quran into modern English is in the treatment of pronominal reference to God. In contemporary English, there is no third person pronoun perfectly well suited to making reference to the transcendent God beyond all human conception. The ultimate shortcoming of human language is natural, of course, and not peculiar to English, but there are particular reasons for attending to the problem of the third person pronoun. Many people of Jewish and Christian background feel alienated from their native face by what they call the quote-unquote angry old man image of God, with which they have been taught to associate religion. Furthermore, what has been perceived as the masculine bias of this image is particularly well known to have alienated many Western women from monotheism. This would seem to be an unnecessary waste. To avoid short-circuiting the attention of significant segments of the modern audience, at such a rudimentary stage. In other words, I'm just trying to get them to think about this. And one of the things that he told me once is he said, Americans can't think about thinking about Islam. 
So in order to prevent that, right, I have translated the third person Arabic pronoun hu wa hu as referring to God, as God, or God as truth, rather than referring to the English pronoun he or him. Now, remember, this is a man who probably knew around 30 languages. So this is really worth uh, thinking about. In technical terms, this means that since the fundamental linguistic resource is the power of reference, one technique for handling difficulties in translation begins with considering language from this point of view. Inasmuch as languages do differ, it is axiomatic that manners of reference can never be completely or perfectly aligned from language to language, and therefore the attempt to do so does not in itself reproduce equivalent powers of reference. Thus, the first priority of translation in terms of meaning is to seek to engage the power of reference as efficiently as possible in whatever manner the target language may afford. In this case, the principle means that a pronoun in one language is not taken to refer to a pronoun in another language, but to the original nominal referent, in other words, back to what it's referring to, for which the pronoun stands, and by which name, noun, it can thus be meaningfully translated. In this case, following the injunction of the Quran to call God by the most beautiful names, I have generally rendered pronominal references to the divine by God, a name which is in this context uniquely unambiguous. And that's really quite stunning what, 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 what he's saying there. So, and so if you read his translation, he has no male pronouns to use for God. Even though we know in Arabic, huwa, can apply to God without any gender reference. Like it is, for somebody to say, you know, my God is a he or a she, that's totally unacceptable in Islamic theology because God is, is not a gender. God is not, he has no binary. God has no uh, izdiwajiya. God is unique. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ اللَّهُ صَمَدٌ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفْوَانْ أَحَدٌ Enough said. Say God, unique. Say God, unique. God is unique. God is independent, needs nothing. He neither produces nor reproduces in some wilada type of way. He creates, but he doesn't produce. There's no production. Kun fayakun, be and it is. Walam yakullahu kuwan ahad. And there's no thing. There's nothing, there's no peer, there's no nadir, there's nothing like God. God is peerless. Alhamdulillah. So can you uh, delve a little deeper into Imam Ghazali's, uh, Ghazali's spiritual crisis? Does it mean he questioned the existence of God? I don't think he questioned, I think what he did was a kind of Cartesian radical doubt as, as a type of intellectual exercise. I think he really wanted to, to try, <coughs> and he precedes Car, Car, uh, Descartes in that. So I think he, he really was doing a, a, I mean, he was a trained intellectual. He was a great scholar, but he was also a trained philosopher. Like he really knew logic. And so I think it, for him, it was much more of an intellectual exercise. I mean, not the, the, the crisis. The crisis was psychological, but the exercise, was uh, was philosophical, so I, that that's how I would view it. I don't think he would have had any doubts um, about that. But we, inshallah, we'll get to ask him when we meet him. Bismillah, inshallah, in the great library. Uh, Jorge is, you know, the great um, writer from South America who won the Nobel Prize. He's one of my favorite favorite writers in English. I wish I could read the level of Spanish that he writes at, but uh, he was great. He had great uh, interest in Islam. But uh, uh, Luis Jorge, his name was Jorge Borges. Um, he, he said that the first thing that he was going to ask the angel when he got to paradise, I mean, if, if he gets to paradise, uh, is where's the library? <laughs> so, I'm doing that. How is one, sub so in, in any way, the, his crises, I mean, I would read the uh, Munqid min al-Dalal, his uh, 
savior from error, uh, because that, uh, that really, he goes into great detail. How is one supposed to view the bad things that are happening around us at the personal and global level? How do we not lose hope? How do we develop and sustain strong tobacco? Well, remember that Imam al-Ghazali, in his genius, put tawakkul, which is trust in God, with tawheed in, in the ihya. So it's, it's kitab, uh, tawheed wa tawakkul. So it's, it's really important to have a strong tawheed, an understanding that everything's from God. To, to, and also to understand that this is darul ibtila. In fact, one of the things that Imam al-Junaid says is that he took a qaida in life and once he took this axiom, this principle in his life, he said nothing ever bothered him after that. And it was that he said, dunya is sharrun kulluha. And it is an abode of tribulation, of trials, of depression, and of uh, anxiety. Like that's, that is the wasf al dar. That's, that's the description of the abode. And so he says, once you accept that, he said, after that, nothing bothered me that came from the Virginia. Because I said, oh, it's just dunya. That's, that's, that's how it is. So there's a stoic element to that, but, and then he said, whatever comes that's not, that doesn't have those qualities is fadl. So just be grateful, right? That what you come, be patient with any tribulation, but be grateful. So it's important, everybody has tribulation. The wealthiest people have tribulation, the poorest people have tribulation. Sometimes the wealthy people have, I mean, I, I've known some really wealthy people that I wouldn't, there's no way I'd trade places with them. Uh, knowing what I know about the tribulations that they have. So this idea that people, oh, people don't suffer you know, uh, because of their color of their skin or because of the wealth that they have. I mean, that's just not knowing the human condition. Every human being has his trials and tribulations. And, and so it's just important to, that we're all here together. Watch out for the demons because they're around. And the, and the human demons are worse than the than the, the, the ones from the spirit world. They are, they're worse. So, you know, you have to develop a, an understanding of your Lord and an understanding of the abode. Reading the Quran with meaning, and one of the things Imam al-Ghazali says, and I actually really appreciate this in the Jawahir, you know, he says that Muslims should think about the Quran. You have to be careful when you have limitations of knowledge, but you should reflect, do tadabbur of the Quran. You can do it in English. These, these meanings, you can reflect on these meanings. But the Quran has an embedded uh, metaphysic that, that, that is not spelt out like a book. It's, it can only be determined by a real engagement. And Imam al-Ghazali says, this is a lifetime of work. I mean, he says it's going to take a lifetime for you to do this work. And Allah's given you about just about enough time. And inshallah, if you you know, for those who die before that time, Allah's, He's merciful and He's just. So He's going to take into consideration, I'm sure, people's, uh, the amount of time they had. But if you've had a lot of time, I mean, Imam al-Ghazali says, if you've reached 40 and your good doesn't outweigh your bad, get ready for hell. Because 40 is a lot of time to work things out. Would you say that we can treat the pronunciation of different riwayat as providing different aspects of meaning? Well, they do provide different aspects of meaning. And also, one of the things about tajweed is that a lot of the rules of tajweed actually have meanings embedded uh, in them. You know, so, I mean, if you look uh, like, uh, you know, I mean, that, that uh, med, med lazim there, has, should have six harakat. So in that med, you, it, it's indicating something about going astray. Like you just keep going down. So tajweed, I mean, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, the rules of tajweed enhance. I mean, if you look, al-hajju ashurum ma'lumat. فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجَّ فَلَا رَفَثَارَ وَلَا فُسُقَ وَلَا جِدَارَ فِي الْحَجِّ وَمَا تَفَعْلُ مَنْ خَيْرًا يَعْلَمْهُ اللَّهِ 
وتزودوا فإن خير الزاد التقوى والتقون يا أول الألباب. So there, يا أول الألباب. It's like calling all these people. يا أول الألباب. ليس عليكم جناح أن تبتغوا فضرا من ربكم فإذا أفضتم من عرفات فاذكروا الله عند مشعر الحرام واذكروه كما هداكم وإن كنتم من قبره لمن الضالين I mean there you go So, so the, the, the rules of tajweed they enhance the meaning like shay usually has a, a med it can go two, four, six in warsh you know I mean, shay is thing, and think of all the things in the world. So in that med, there's an indication of something of the nature of things, that they just go on. So, uh, and, and then you have, um, you have uh, the, the Arabs, because the Prophet ﷺ was sent first to all the Arabs, and then to the Ajam but first to the Arabs. He was first sent to his own people. One way of honoring them was to put all of the lahajats into the Quran. So you'll find all the Arab dialects have a, they'll, they'll find their dialect in the Quran, which is a way of saying, marhaban, you know, we include you. So it wasn't this Qurayshi hegemony where you just impose your language on the rest of the Arabs. In fact, Hafs, which is the most recited Quran today, is Beni Tamim. It's it's the uh, it's the <coughs> excuse me. It's the Arabs from the uh, Najd. They're Mudar Arabs, but they you know the people in Qatar are from Beni Tamim, they're like the, uh, the the ruling family of Qatar. They're they're from Beni Tamim. So that's their language to say Yu'man. The Prophet said Yu'man. He didn't pronounce the Hamza. So Nafi' on Warsh, Qalun has uh, the, the Hamza, but Warsh has no Hamza. That, so, and that's why Madik considered Nafi' to be a Sunnah, and particularly the Riway of Warsh, which is why the Malikis all read it as a Sunnah. So Madik actually saw Warsh was Sunnah. And that's why all the, the, the Libyans recite Qalun, because they, they were next to Egypt, and Egypt, uh, Hafs became the dominant Qira. Qalun's very close to Hafs. But the rest of the Malikis all over North and West Africa recite with Warsh. In, uh, the Malikis in Sudan recite with uh, Abu Amr. Yeah, like that beautiful reciter, Sheikh Nurain, who died right when he was becoming famous. It's like Allah said, time to take you. And he had already done the whole Quran. A beautiful reciter. So they definitely... Give, and then also with the recensions, you have things like, uh, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Udhina lilladhini yuqatiluna bi annum dhulimu. That's one qira. Udhina lilladhini yuqatiluna. So one has the passive, the other has, you know, the active form of the verb. So they were given permission, those who were being fought, but also because they were being fought. But then it also says they were given permission to fight. So it has both. And then, and that's why, because, you know, when they when they when they got into the fight in uh, in the Ashhur al Haram, I mean, the Quran revealed that it was you know it was permitted for them to do that because they were being oppressed. Would fit into akbar min al qatri, would fit into ashadu min al qatri. So there, akbar wa ashad. So one says akbar, the other says ashad. So you have all these nuances. Uh, you have, for instance, in. Um, uh, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. You have uh, uh, in ja'akum fasiqun bi nab'in fatabayyanu. In, 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 that's one qira'a. Tathabbatu is another qira'a. If you look at how it's written without the diacritical marks, it's written the same way in the Rasm al-Uthmani. But the diacritical marks which were added later during the time of uh, al-Hajjaj. The, the meaning of tabayyanu is make sure you understand the meaning. But to thabbatu is make sure that the source is sound. So in that one verse are both those meanings. And there are many examples. He's not like withholding. He's not, it's not, he's not making it up. It's not just his uh, um, 
opinions about the unseen. So the, the, the qira'ats are really, even the shadda qira'at are very interesting. The ahad qira'at, qaja'ala rabbu shi tahta shi sariya. I mean, the, the re- it's a shad qira'a, but the reason it's interesting is because the dialect that you find in the Gulf Arabs, kif halish, you know, uh, uh, they, they use the kaf, they pronounce it like a sheen or a ch sound. That's a, that's a very ancient Arabic dialect. So the qira'at have preserved also. And then things like Rome and Ishmam. I mean, if you look at the Ishmam, one, it's a proof that you have to take the Qur'an from Aqari because there's no way you can learn Ishmam without doing it shafawiyan. You can't read how to do it. It's just something you have to, you know, you have to learn how to get that from Aqari. It doesn't change the... Uh, I mean, that's just a really interesting aspect of the Qur'an. So, Tajweed to me is one of the real proofs of, of, uh, of the preservation of the Qur'an. Just the fact that we, all of the sects of Islam agree on all ten qira'at. I mean, what religion has that? Like, they don't debate it. And the Shia use the Shatabiya and the Durra, which are both from Sunni scholars. They don't have any problem. They use the Alfi of Ibn Malik. He's a Sunni scholar. So, so there's no even like Ahmadiyya have the same. They have the same uh, Quran as 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 the rest of the Muslims. So every group, uh, whether the Ismaili or the uh, Bora uh, Dawoodis, uh, every group they have the same Qurans. Nobody differs about the Quran. The Christians differ. The 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 Protestants only accept the Hebrew Bible. They don't accept the, um, the, the, some of the apocryphal texts. It has to be in the Hebrew Bible, whereas the Catholics accept texts that are uh, in the apocryphal as well. So anyway, is that, is that it? Last question? All right. Alhamdulillah. Subhanakum alhamdulillah. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta. Astaghfiruku wa tubu ilayk. Wa al-asri inna l-insana lafi khusar. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا